Hey, good morning, church. Good morning. So good to see you all. So good to see all of your smiling faces, conversations, fellowship. Praise the Lord. Hey, we are here at Hope Church Midway. For those online, welcome to Hope Church. Uh, we would love to have you in attendance here so we can fellowship and worship our God together. Everyone who is here, we are excited to praise God. So let's stand to our feet. And today's song we're going to sing, Won't Stop Now. We know that God is moving. We know that God is in our midst. We know his name. We know he is Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider. He is our strength. He is everything we need. And he is here. We give him glory right now. Amen. So, God, we will not stop praising you. We won't give up on your word, on your truth. We stand on it. And, God, we sing our praises to you right now, Lord. So we pray this is a, an offering to you, God, a sweet-smelling fragrance to you right now, Jesus. Hallelujah. Clap our hands. I give you glory for all you brought me through. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward to follow after you. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. Sing your presence. Your presence is an open door. Hallelujah. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your Your presence. Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your believe that breakthrough is coming. Hallelujah. We're going to declare that right now with our words, that breakthrough is coming. Right now, I see a miracle. We're going to sing that out. Shout of praise. Hallelujah. God, we receive your presence, God. We receive your miracle. God, we lift your name on high right now, God. A 
sing now. You sing your presence. Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. Yes, Jesus. God, we believe that breakthrough is coming right now. God, we praise you and lift your name on high, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's sing that. Let's sing breakthrough is coming. I know breakthrough is coming by faith. I see a miracle. Got a hand clap of praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. God, our praises will rise in this place, God. Let our praises rise to the King of glory right now. God, because all we want, God, is to be in your presence, Lord. All we want is for you to be glorified above anything else. God, just as John the Baptist said, let me be less and less so you can be more and more, God. So I pray, God, that you will reign in our hearts right now in our minds, God, in this space. May you fill this space with your presence and do what you will, God. You know your people. That's the beautiful thing about you, God. You know your people, so you can meet, be in this room with all of us and meet each person individually, Lord. So I just ask, God, that you will move and do what you will right now, God. Praises. Let praises rise from the inside, from the inside of me. May you delight on the inside, in the inside of me. Come. From the inside of me, set me on fire. From the inside, yes, God. From the inside of me, cause all I want is for you. For you to be lifted high, all I want is for you, for you to be glorified. 
crucified for you to be lifted high. Let praises rise from the inside, from the inside of me. May you delight in the inside, in the inside, that's all. In the inside of me, come fill my life from the inside. Yes, Lord. From the inside of me, and set me on fire from the inside. people want to glorify you, God. Only your name is great, God. Only your name is mighty. Only your name is mighty to save, God. Hallelujah. We lift you up today, God. God, 
God, we declare right now, God, that we will not go back to the way things were, God, before your presence came and took over. We will not go back to those things, Jesus. Hallelujah. Sing, I won't go back. Your presence came and changed me. Yeah, sing that out. I won't go back. I can't go back to the way it used to be. Before your presence came and changed me. Sing, I've been changed. I've been changed. Forgiven on the cross. Forgiven. There's no more chains. Fear. My past is over. My past is over. Hallelujah.
I won't go back. I won't go back. I can't go back to the way you used to be. For your presence came, changed me. I won't go back. Can't go back to the way you used to be. For your presence came and changed me. Playing the song, and I want you to just take a moment and worship God to pray to Him to begin to renounce some things, to rebuke some things, let's turn away from, let's turn away from this sin and guilt that the enemy tries to put over us. Let's lay it at Jesus' feet. Let's lay it at the cross. Go ahead and take a moment and pray. God, some praise. Amen. 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 All right. Say hello to your brothers and sisters. Amen. Thank you, Lord.
what might feel like chaos even before walking through the door that you could bring us here together for a time of just praising you and worshiping you and just giving up and sacrificing of our time knowing that you give us everything. And I pray that you would be with each one of us as we are preparing to give of our offerings, Lord God, that you would bless the giver, Lord God, in their faithfulness and that you would just position those finances specifically to wherever you want it to go, Lord God. We give everything that we have, hopefully every day, to you because you're amazing. We love you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. We also want to let you guys know that we do have prayer. We have a prayer team that actively prays for your, your needs throughout the week. If you could do what you can to fill out a prayer or praise request card in front of you. You can also drop those off in the give boxes, but we also have a prayer request link through the YouVersion link. Or you can just call us, you can text us, you can even, you know what, you can even talk to us in person. That's amazing. What? <laughs> I heard that. So, <laughs> but we love our church family and we love to be with you guys, not only through the highs of highs of life, but also the lows of lows. And we won't know about those. I was just telling somebody else uh, earlier, a few weeks ago or within the week, that, you know, we'll only be a part of your lives as much as you allow us to be a part of your lives. And that goes not just as a pastoral team, but also as just a church family and how we love one another through the highs and the lows. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we also want to let you guys know that we do have this Wednesday as Midweek Coffee House. So um, we do have a QR code in the back for some anonymous questions for Coffee House. Um, and what we do, if you've never been to one before, we uh, answer and discuss together as a group questions that people have or that they've received that they're not sure how to answer about God, religion, or the church. And so you can submit those anonymous questions. We'll discuss it over a little chit chat, a little food, a little snack, and then we look at what the scriptures say because that's the most important to know how the scriptures respond to all of our our situations, and that's our roadmap to life. It's the word of God. So um, yes, join us on Wednesday. We also have Thursday men's Bible study, so you don't want to miss that for all those guys. And then at the back table, there's a sign-up sheet. It's kind of a makeshift sign-up sheet, <laughs> but we are having um, an event that we're supporting in the community, which is the Back to School Bash, which is on October um, August 10th. And so if you would like to help with that at the table or just at the event in general, I'm sure that uh, they would love to have any volunteers, not just at our Hope Church Midway table, but at the event in general, because it's a community-wide event. It's going to be at the Kennedy High School parking lot. And it's something that they do every year, and we're just so blessed to be a part of it because it's not a church thing. It's a community thing, and we love our community. So sign up in the back if you'd like to be a part of that. Um, and we also want to just remind you guys that we do have Breaking Bread today, which is our once-a-month opportunity for us to just get to know one another over a meal. And so we're going to do things a little bit differently where we have the food downstairs, but then because the weather is so nice, we'll gather our food, and then we'll hang out outside. Um, one thing that we'll need after service is uh, just some hands to help put out some extra tables and chairs and do some setup. So um, if you're like, you know what, I didn't get to bring a dish. You know what? You have two hands, some muscles, pull up some chairs, tables, and help us out. That'd be wonderful. But thank you. Good to see everyone. I am still alive after a week of camp. So thank you for your prayers. Uh, no, it was a great time. I was uh, able to be dean at our youth camp, and it was great, and Courtney was there. Our youth pastor was down there with some of our students. We had an excellent time. It was fun. Uh, got to see God do some amazing, miraculous things uh, that we are really excited about. Um, but I also wanted to say, give God some praise and some stuff that just happened this last week that are some answers to some prayers that we've been praying. Some of you were here a couple of weeks ago um, in our midweek. And uh, we had a person come in as we did our last coffee house, and they said that they had just found out that their sister was in, um, was in the hospital, and uh, they thought that the baby was going to be lost. She was pregnant, thought the baby was going to be lost, and they also thought she was going to lose her life as well, to the point where they didn't even let her mom come in to see her. That's how bad that was. Um, and we, we stopped everything, we prayed for her, and the baby was just born this last week. So it was awesome. So baby born and mom alive, two great things, amen? So that's a, it's a great thing to see what God's done. Also, there's something we've been praying for over a year and a half at least as a church 
Um, many of you know as well, uh, we have an individual who attends here who's unfortunately with her work schedule isn't able to come on Sundays as much as she likes, uh, but watches online. And uh, she had, she's uh, suffered a horrendous loss of her three-year-old son who was shot tragically. Um, and that happened over a year and a half ago. And they were not able to get the killer, but we are grateful they charged the guy this last week. Um, so that is awesome. So we continue to pray for full justice to happen. Amen. Um, so we want to continue to pray for that um, as it's great to see uh, the police being able to put together everything that has happened. And uh, it's awesome to see. So just to let you know, God answers prayers. And you might be praying for a while and say, okay, God, we've been waiting, we've been waiting, we've been waiting. God's never late, right? He's never late. So I just want us to pause, and we're just going to want to thank God. Uh, so God, we thank you. God, we pray hard, but we should also praise hard as well. God, in our thanks, God, of what you're doing. God, these miracles, God, a great miracle of not just one life, but two lives. God, being able to come to fruition. God, we continue to pray for this baby that's there, is still growing and still uh, needing help, needing your guidance. So God, we pray you will continue to guide, continue to help this mom as she's there in the hospital with her child. God, I pray you will continue to work as only you can. God, we thank you for what we've seen, God, in this person who murdered this three-year-old, this innocent child. God, we are grateful that the police put together what seems like just solid, solid evidence, God, to be able to put this person away, to have real justice. God, we pray that you would help out, continue to help out in every single way. May everything come to light. God, as your word says, God, we pray that you would move, God, continuously. We thank you for what you have done, God, what you're going to continue to do. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. I also have another uh, congratulations. I want to congratulate Daniel and Jalisa. They just got married this last Sunday. So... <laughs> I told him ahead of time I was going to embarrass him, so he knew, he knew ahead of time, and so that's all right. Uh, we want to say thank you so much. You know, I mean, the Bible says two people coming together, it's like a mystery, Paul says. It's amazing how two lives can come together as one. You know, that they complement each other's differences, they work together, they help to build one another up. It's great because the Bible also says that our relationship with God is like a marriage. It uses that as a metaphor throughout the Bible, that our, our, marriage, our, our marriage with God is like that relationship. So us saying, I do, is saying, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. That's a, a way of us giving our vows, if you will. And if you think about it, God doesn't just complement our differences. He complements our deficiencies. He helps to bring us up when we are having those lower things in our life, things that we need to help from him. He works with us helps us up, and builds us up together. It's amazing to see that. You know, my wife and I are just about to celebrate our anniversary next week, 23 years, because um, we got married when we were 12. And uh, so, uh, I always joke around with her. She's five months older than me, but she looks like 10 years younger than me, so she wins. Um, but, you know, it's, it's great to see what God has done. But think about after we got married, what our marriage would have been like if I said, hey, it's so great that we come together as one. But you know what? I want my ex to move in. <laughs> y'all, got, y'all got quiet there fast, all right? So people got some emotions real quick that just happened, all right? Right? I mean, that would be, that'd be the most awkward thing in the world. Like, you are setting yourself up for failure, Right? And there's a lot of times we're not necessarily going to have an ex come in, but sometimes we'll flirt with our ex-life, right? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And as the old saying goes, if you can't say amen, you have to say ouch. So there's some times we're going to be looking at this, and God might just hit you in a good way. Again, it's not condemnation of, hey, you're such a horrible person, but it's conviction saying, hey, this is something I want to work with you in your life. Amen? And so this is a, a series we've been doing called the seven love letters, or the love letters that are there. These are seven letters that Jesus wrote in Revelation 2 and 3 to these seven different churches. And these were actual churches with real things that were happening, but these are things that still affect us to this day. And today we're going to look at this metaphor of a relationship of people having a marriage with God, but having this ex move in. So if you want to turn to Revelation chapter 2, we'll be starting in verse 12. Jesus is talking to a church and he needs to kick their ex out of their relationship, all right? So, and God's going to speak to us as well of different exes we might need to kick out of our relationship as well, amen? Let's look at this. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. I know that you live in a city where Satan has his throne, and you have remained loyal to me. You refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. 
Let's tell you a little bit about this city. I mean, it's pretty big. I mean, we call Vegas Sin City. He's saying this is Satan's city. This is like next level here. And so let me tell you a little bit about per Pergamum. So it was a hard place for believers. As we saw, someone even died here. It was a hard place to be a believer. This was the intellectual capital of the Roman Empire. This was a place, uh, just think of all the Ivy League schools in one spot. That's what this basically was. Is the intellectual capital. They were very, very big into politics. They even worshipped politicians as well. And they had an entire row of different gods that they could have, that people could look at. They were very big into worshipping other idols. This is where it was at. Their culture was not kind to Christians. They're in an area where the culture is not kind to Christians. We see that Antipas, this is a man that was there, was killed for not bowing to this culture by saying, I'm standing up for God. I'm not going to be bowing down to things that the culture tells me to do. So this is where we're at. I mean, Jesus literally says Satan has his throne there. Now, there's a lot of different debate of exactly what Jesus was talking about when he said Satan has his throne. Some people point out to, uh, there was a, 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 a statue of Zeus that was there that was one of the seven wonders of the world. It's actually... Uh, to the day in uh, a museum in Germany. In fact, they said that Hitler used to go there a lot. So it tells you, it might be a Satan, throne room of Satan. You know, uh, so just a very demonic thing that was there in, in uh, um, Pergamum. There's also, they had an entire row full of temples for all different gods. It was, you just walk down and say, okay, I want to worship this god, this god, this god, this god. I got a whole entire row where people could see this. And it was just right in their face at all times. They also had an, an idea where people would come there if they had medical diseases. They would go to this particular uh, um, area where they had snakes that were on the ground. Good place to go. And uh, they would sleep there at night. And the idea of sleeping there at night is that if a snake touched you during the night, then you would get a healing. This is the kind of craziness that was built there and the kind of things that people had. And so this had a lot of demonic things that were taking place there that a lot of these you can say, yeah, seems like Satan's city, right? You know, and so they had all this different stuff throughout that was just very, very demonic that people were going through there. In fact, if you actually look at the medical symbol, you see a snake that is in reference to that idol. So there you go. Uh, so you see all these different parts that are a part of this culture. Now, we must know that Christianity from its beginning has always been counterculture. It's countercultural. You know, why? Because our, our own desires inside us is where our sin comes from. And so for Jesus saying, I'm setting you free from that, and I'm helping you to not go that direction anymore, well, that's automatically counter to your own culture, to your own life. And so it's going to be counterculture in general. You might say, but we live in America. That's a Christian nation. I'd say, uh, have you looked at America lately? Um, so I would have no doubts on that, you know? I mean, we have to ask ourselves, well, if uh, we had such a Christian nation, then why are Christians canceled so very, very easily in our nation? See, people like the idea of Jesus, but they don't really like his teaching. We like the idea of love. We like the idea of forgiveness. We like the idea of mercy, but we don't want him to actually tell us on the guidance in our lives and which direction we want to go. We don't like that. And so whenever we bring that up, people are like, oh, yeah, Jesus is great. And Jesus said this about marriage. Jesus said this about this. Or this about an issue. This is what adultery is. All these other things. We're like, oh, yeah, I don't want to hear that. I'm good, but I like the idea of Jesus. So no matter what, when we see, when we start going that direction and we start seeing what Jesus actually says, people have an issue because our culture isn't kind to Christians either. None of them are because it's counterculture. The Christian life isn't one that is easy, but it's worth it. And this church believed it. They were following. He said, you were faithful. Even when the guy died, they were still faithful continuously. They refused to deny even unto death. That sounds pretty faithful, right? Even when Antipas died, they said, we're still focusing on here. So why does Jesus need to talk to them with a two-edged sword? Maybe you caught that when we read it. Like, okay, what's, what's going on with there? Well, let's talk about what this two-edged sword is. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 describes this. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. So what is he saying here? Where our, our soul is our mind, our emotions, and our will. Our spirit, so he's saying split between the soul and the spirit, our spirit is that part of us that comes to life, the eternal part of us that comes to life when we start to follow Jesus. 
So we have this eternal part of us that's not even fully alive until we start to see Jesus. And so we start to follow him. The Bible says you go from death to life when you start to follow him. It's an amazing miracle that God does in our lives. And he says he helps us separate our mind, our will, and our emotions from affecting our eternal self. That's pretty big. That's pretty big. Because you know what? Your mind, your will, and your emotions are going to do the same thing that mine do. It's going to make you want to do the things that you want to do and not what God wants you to do. That's what it's going to do. The same thing I have to struggle with, the same thing you have to struggle with. Your mind, your will, and your emotions is going to start to guide you in a certain direction that's counter to what God wants you to go. And he says, hey, I'm helping to divide that so one doesn't take over the other. So he's helping us to make sure we can see that difference. When we say, I do, to following God, that's our spirit coming to life. But a lot of times, we can bring waste into our relationship. We can bring bad things into our relationship. I mean, even when I, when I married Jen, there was some self-serving things I had to give up when I married her. You know, my time, my money, you know, all this other stuff from my past. I had to say, I'm not living like I'm single anymore. I'm married. When we start to follow God, we have to stop living like we're single, right? Yeah. All right, there's just a couple amens. All right? <laughs> some people are like, I like the single life. All right? <laughs> Again, when you said I do to God, you're saying, I did. No one put a gun to your head. All right, this isn't a shotgun wedding, okay? You said on your own free will, yes, he is Lord. He's calling the shots. He's in the driver's seat. The moment you say that, you're saying, okay, I'm following you. And yes, are we going to fight for that wheel? You better believe it, unfortunately. We're going to fight for control. It's going to happen to all of us. But we continue to pray and say, God, let me give you that wheel more and more. Let me give that over to you. That's a big thing for us to see. But a lot of times we can bring waste into our relationship, that single life. That I, had, that I had before with Jen, my mind had to change from being single to being married. That takes a while. That takes some time. We tell people all the time, the first year or two of your marriage is going to be the hardest thing in the world because you're learning how to become one. That's a difficult thing. And we're like, look, you're going to have to pray that through. You're going to have to meet through. You're going to have to talk about these things. Like, there's stuff you have to do because that's hard for two to become one. As a, when you become a new believer, it's hard for two to become one. That's a difficult thing. Honestly, it's a difficult thing. And aren't you glad that the God gave us the church so we don't have to do it alone? Amen. You know? It's a great thing. Just like when people have marital problems, if they just keep it to themselves and they don't ask for help from other people, whether they're just going to be dealing it with themselves, right? And that's a problem. Same thing in our own walk with God. If we're keeping that to ourselves, we're going to have problems. God wants us to come together to help us. Amen? Amen. So that's a big thing. It's important for us to see we can't bring our waste into a relationship and then wonder why it stinks. I'll say that again. We can't bring our, relation, our waste into our relationship and then wonder why it stinks. So a lot of times like, wow, this Christian life doesn't seem like how I want it to be. Why? Because we're still living the single life even though we're married to God. We're still living that way and we're saying, well, why is this going on? Because we have to give that over. And what helps us to do that? God's word. It helps us separate that part of us that's that emotional part, that, that part of us that wants to overthink things to allow ourselves to go that different direction, that part of us that's making excuses to say, no, God, this is the direction you want me to go. I'm going to go that direction. I'm going to follow that way because I know that you love me. I know that you care for me. I know you have the best for me, and I can trust you in this. And that changes everything, changes everything. Again, this is where the sword comes in. God exposes our thoughts and our desires. He sees what's actually truth and what's waste. And we have to be okay with doing that. That's why we encourage you to read the Bible every single day, not for information, but for transformation. God, help me to see when I need to change within my life. Because you're going to change to the moment you see Jesus. You should. I want to be closer to God six months from now than I am right now. I want to be. I want to be walking more like Jesus six months from now than I am right now. And we all should have that same desire because we're never going to be fully like Jesus until we see him face to face. And that's okay. It's okay to know that you have room to grow when God's helping you with the growth. You're not trying to do it on your own. God's there with you, helping you out, strengthening you, giving you those guidance that you need. So what is the waste that this church is burning in? Let's look back, Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans who come among you with the same teaching. So who is Balaam? Let's start with that. And some of you are like, I have no idea what in the world that is. All right, so Balaam was a prophet of God. Now, this is a person who did hear from God. 
It's a person who, even though he was a prophet of God, he liked prophets of money in his pocket more than he liked following God. And that's a problem. See, God can give people spiritual gifts, and we can choose to use them for him, or we can choose to use them for ourselves. That's a big thing. That's why you have people who are like, well, if you send me $40,000 and you help me get a plane, you go to different places to spare the word. Yeah, we've all seen those morons, and yes, I could use stronger words. Yes, we've seen these charlatans that will say, if you, I will give you a, a cloth that will help to heal you if you give me this kind of money. And it's not that God hasn't worked in their lives before. It's not that God hasn't helped them out before. Or God has given them a spiritual gift before. It's not that that. But they're just like Balaam. Hey, give me money and I will show you a miracle. Now, that's what Balaam was about. There's a, a king by the name of Balak who was a, a king who was wanting to go up against Israel. And he said, hey, I'll give you this money if you curse Israel for me. So I know that God listens to you. I know that God is there with you. We all know that you are this great prophet. And so if you help us out, I'll line your pockets. And at first, Balaam comes over and he starts to pray to God. And he's like, God, will you help me to curse your people? Isn't that a stupid prayer? <laughs> like literally, as he's speaking, you're reading, you're like, you are a moron. Like you know the answer before you even ask. How many of you have asked a question in prayer and you knew the answer before you even asked? <laughs> God, should I date that person? You know the answer. All right? <laughs> I'm going to ask that prayer anyway, all right? You know, you know like, there's different things like that that you know the answer way before you need to ask it. And that's where Balaam's at here. He knows the answer, but he's still asking. God's like, uh, no. No, you won't. It's like, okay. Comes back to the king. Nope. God said no, and I have to answer what he says. I'm staying on my principle. And you're like, good job. Balaam, you're an idiot for a second, but good job. All right, you're moving on. And then the king's like, hey, I'll give you some money. He's like, let me pray again. <laughs> then he comes over and he prays again. And he's like, nope, God still said no. And he said, well, hey, let me come over here and I'll talk to you more. I'll feed your ego here a little bit more. You can walk here with the king. This is going to be a great thing. Don't you feel so nice and powerful that you're here with me? And how about I give you some more money and maybe now you'll curse, you'll curse God's people. And he's like, okay, yeah, no, let me pray about it some more. I think this is, this is good. I'm feeling good about this. This is a great thing. I like my, my power, my authority, my title. People outside of the church are hearing about me. This is great. He's feeling himself really well. Praise again. God's like, what, what are you, stupid? You know, I, I told you already. No, you are not to curse these people. And he's like, all right, hey, just letting you know, can't curse them. And by your dawn, you're like, okay, Balaam, you were a moron, but you still stood on your principles, and you went off, and you did not curse them. Good job. Good job. You know, and that's what happens at, as you get to the end. You think he did a pretty good job. But you see, it's important for us to understand, Balaam couldn't curse God's people because they were married to God. But he could tempt them to cheat. And that's exactly what Balaam does. It's like, look, I can't curse you. You're God's people, but we bring some temptation to have a little affair here on the side. See, it's important to see the Israelites, they came out of slavery. This is their past. This is their ex-life. Their ex-life, not ex-wife, their ex-life, <laughs> people are like, I got out of slavery from my ex-wife. Okay, all right. You know, <laughs> I was out of slavery from their ex Life And so in their ex-life, what did they have? They saw idol worship all around them. They saw temple prostitution all around them, sexual sin all around them. This was their culture. This was their past. This is what they grew up around. This is what they saw all around. This was their ex-life. Then after Balaam leaves, because he can't curse Israel, this happens. We see about this in Numbers chapter 25, verse 1. It says this. While the Israelites were camped at the Acadia Grove, some of the men defiled themselves by having sexual relations with local Moabite women. These women invited them to attend sacrifices to their gods. So the Israelites feasted with them and worshipped the gods of Moab. These married men went back to their ex-life. You might say, but, but how is Balaam responsible for this? He left. He, he, he took off. How is Balaam responsible for this? Well, the Bible talks about this in Numbers 31.16. It says this. These are the very ones who follow Balaam's advice and cause the people of Israel to rebel against the Lord at Mount Peor. They are the ones who cause the plague to strike the Lord's people. Because again, Balaam couldn't cause them, couldn't curse them, but he could tempt them to cheat. So we're the exact same way. The enemy can't, cause, can't curse us, but he can tempt us to cheat. To so go back to our ex-life. Very very easily. 
I mean, we just had a wonderful song talking about being saved, healed, delivered. And we're like, yes, and who's the sun sets free is free indeed. And we are glad for these awesome things. And God has set us with this wonderful freedom, just like he did with the children of Israel. And they were set free from their past. They were set free from all those things. And what did they do? They just had someone come over there that was a religious leader and said, hey, how about you talk to them about cheating? How about you talk to them about going back? How about you remind them about all the things that they could have that's going to feed those sinful desires that they have? Because yes, you're set free, but how many of you know you still got desires because you still live in a fallen world? Right? You can't say amen, got to say ouch, all right? Let's be real here. I am a perfect Christian. I never have any desires at all. You're breathing. You got desires. We live in a fallen world. Your desires might be different than my desires, but you know what? We're all fighting. We're all in a spiritual battle. And the enemy's trying to do the same thing to us. He can't curse us. He can't touch us. You're God's child. He can't touch you. It's important for you to know that. You are covered. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. He can't touch you, but he can convince you to cheat. Yeah, this this ring shows that I'm still married. But guess what? If my wife's not around, the enemy can try to put things in my head. Yes, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're married to God, absolutely. But the enemy can start to put stuff in our heads very, very easily to go astray. What does that look like in our lives? Well, this isn't hurting anyone. I can do this. Anybody ever said that in your mind? Maybe you said something like this. I can handle it. That's not a big deal. I can handle it. This doesn't overtake me. This doesn't control me. Or maybe this one, the fun one. Nobody knows. So it's okay. Nobody knows. These are all different ways that we cheat and we go back to our ex-life. It's important for us to understand people can cheat on God and still go to church. Just like a married man can cheat on his wife and still go back to her. Try to pretend nothing ever happened. These things happen. And it even happens in the church. And that's why we have to be open and say, God, allow me to be honest with myself and honest with you. Where am I at right now? And again, I will say what I said at the beginning. This is not condemnation. This is conviction. It's not God saying, well, I can't believe you did all these things and you've been doing all this stuff on the side. You've been trying to hide these things and acting like nobody knows. This is not a big deal. It's not hurting anybody. All the lies that, again, our soul tries to tell our spirit to go the wrong way. And here's the word of God that's splitting this. And you're like, oh, that's hard. But sometimes things are painful because they need to be cut. Sometimes some things, some hooks that the enemy has in our lives need to be cut. And it's painful when they are. But you know what? You get freedom when they're cut. And that's why it's not condemnation, it's conviction. You can go a different direction. You can go another path. It's important for us to understand this. I mean, this is what Jesus is telling this church. He's like, look, you are still at church, but you're cheating on God. What are they doing? They're eating meat that's offered to idols. They're having sexual sin. They're following the Nicolaitans. And they say, well, who are these people, these Nicolaitans? And I said a couple weeks ago, I was going to talk about them today. There's a lot of different arguments of who these people are and what they believe. My favorite thing to talk about this is just what their name means in Greek, and it helps us out to understand who they are. The Greek means to conquer the people, to conquer the people. So these are people who were experts that were showing that they were better than the common people and saying, hey, I can tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you what to do. People who came into the church and said, hey, I'm going to let you know the right way to follow God. Listen to me, and I'm going to show you the right way to follow God. It's the same thing we see in society trying to tell Christians how to live. Live free. Live free. God has set you free. That's great. Then be free. You can flirt and even cheat with your ex. It's okay. You have freedom in Christ. You're still filled with the Holy Spirit. God still got this in your life. It's okay. Be free. Do what you want. Do what feels right. Do what you've always desired to do. But you still have the freedom of God because you said a prayer. Yes, you're not following him. You're not walking with him. But you know what? You said a prayer, so everything's great. That's what we see in society. We see this whole fight of what they try to talk freedom. And what is Jesus showing here? No, it's not freedom. No, you're going back into slavery. You think you're free, but you're actually becoming a slave. You're going back to your ex-life. You're married to me, and you're cheating and not finding a problem with that. That's a hard thing. It's a horrible thing. You know, it's interesting. When you see people who have had different extramarital affairs, nowadays, 90% of what has happened is, oh, an ex DM'd me. That's where it starts. Nine times out of ten, that's what you see nowadays. Somebody from their past starts to talk to them. And then, oh, it's fine, I'm just catching up with somebody that I used to talk to. And then there's a little flirtation, there's a little, you know, oh yeah, that's fine. 
not even realizing because it's not a big deal. It's not hurting anybody. Nobody knows. It's fine, and we think everything is good. We're cheating on our spouse without even realizing because what does Jesus say? Jesus says adultery is just imagining things in your head, not even the actuality of doing it. And so we've allowed ourselves to commit adultery with our old life without even realizing we're already doing it because we're saying, oh, it's not a big deal. I haven't done anything yet. That's just in one area. We can look at this in any area of our lives when this deceit comes into our lives. You know, and we think, I can go back to this place and it's not a big deal. It's okay. I can handle this. We go into these things constantly in our lives and Jesus says, no, I'm bringing the sword to remind you, hey, this is what your soul is telling you. This is what your spirit needs. And I'm dividing this for you. Again, not feeling condemnation, but bringing conviction so we can see change. That's important for us to know. He cares about us. So again, this is what society tells Christians how to live in this quote-unquote freedom. But let's see what the Bible says. Romans 6, verse 12 says this. And this is a great couple of verses for you to memorize sometime. Do not let sin control the way that you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you are no longer to live under the requirements of the law. Let's pause there. This is so crucial for us to know. You are set free. You don't have to go back. And many of us need to know that in this room. You don't have to go back. Even if you find yourself flirting with your past life, even this last week, you can say, look, I don't have to go back there because God has set you free. Let's continue on here. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, doesn't that mean that we can go on, does that mean that we can go on sinning? Of course not. So if you're thinking, hey, these are my desires, this is what I want to do, this is my ex-life, and I can go back there because God's grace is so great and he's so forgiving, I can go back to that place, here's your verse. This is that sword that's cutting right down. Of course not. Don't you realize you become a slave of whatever you choose to obey? You could be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you could choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. It's important for us to know God has set us free. We had a word that God gave somebody uh, in the church during worship, and they told me uh, before, and they said, I don't know if it's for me, it's for somebody else. I was like, "Uh, I know where this is going. And it's the freedom that we have, the newness that God has for us. We need to realize that we've been renewed. We need to walk in freedom. For so many times, we're so worried about the ex-life that we forget the freedom that we have. If you're walking in your freedom, you're not going to worry about your ex-life. If my focus in my life is my wife and not my ex, guess what? I'm going to have a better marriage. If our focus is on God and not our ex-life, you're going to have a better walk with God. You're going to have a better marriage with God. You're going to see that difference that happens in our life. It's important to know what these verses are saying. Free does not mean that we can fool around. Being free does not mean we can fool around. Great line for your notes for you to put in there. We are married to God. We can't have a mistress. Say it again. We are married to God. We can't have a mistress. Can't say, hey, it's okay. I'm following God, but I got this other thing on the side. It's not what God has for us. He has us with freedom. The Bible says that God is a jealous God. Does that mean he's got some issues and he's got some insecurities? No, he's like, look, I know where this life is going to take you. I care about you so much for you to go this direction. I want you to go the right way. He's jealous for us, not jealous of the other thing. He's jealous for us. It's important for us to understand and realize he cares about us. See, some of us have been flirting with the ex-life for so long that we wonder, well, what does it mean to be this renewed? What, what does it mean? How do, how do I get to this place where I let that ex-life go away and I say I'm going to be solidifying my life with God? Well, it's, it's what some people do. Some people even renew their vows after this. And they say, you know what? I need to have this time where I just need to be back there with my spouse. I need to show where I'm at and to show there's a big change that we've had in our life. And we want to renew our vows. And that's a, a beautiful way of doing it. And here, Jesus says something very, very similar talking to this church. Again, back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 16. Repent of your sin, or I will come suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. It's important for us to understand, who is God fighting? Who's he fighting? So a lot of times we'll read this verse and we're like, God's going to come after me if I don't stop flirting with my ex-life. 
he's going to come after me. And we feel that God's coming after us. Not what it says. I will come after them, not you. And there's so many of us, unfortunately, that feel that God is so mad at us, that he's just zeroing in on us, that he's so disappointing with us, that we feel this condemnation that God is not bringing you in this verse. He's bringing you freedom in this verse. I'm going to fight against the thing that's coming at you. It's not going to be that easy to look at porn anymore. I'm going to fight against that. It's not going to be easy to get drunk anymore. I'm going to start putting things back in your mind. I'm going to put verses back in your mind. He's going to start pushing all these other things that happen from our ex-life and say, I have something better for you. He's going to start to push this. Why? Because he cares about you so much. He says, I will fight against them. Why? Because God wants you to be victorious. You are meant for victory, not for slavery. It's important for you to realize that. God wants to show you the freedom he has for you. See, Jesus isn't going to let the ex stay. No, he says that he's going to fight with the sword. He's going to allow the Bible to reveal the truth. And we have to be okay with that. Because unfortunately what happens is God will shine the light of truth in us with the word. We feel bad about it because it's conviction. We feel bad about it and we say, I, I need to leave the church for a while. If you don't say amen, you got to say ouch. And we'll feel that way. Well, I got to leave. You know, I'm feeling bad. You know, he's, he's showing this. You know, I, I don't like how this makes making me feel. God is showing you with love. He's saying, I care about you too much for you to continue to walk down that road because I know where that road goes. I don't want you in slavery anymore. I want you to find the freedom I have for you. So allow me to show you that freedom. I mean, just look at God's love here. What does he say? Repent of your sin. He's giving them chance after chance after chance. This is not a condemning God. This is a loving God who's saying, I'm there to help you out. I'm there to back you up because I believe in you. I care about you. I don't want you in your slavery. I want you in your freedom. I love this quote that I found this last week, or two weeks ago. I thought this was great. Repentance is an invitation. It's not condemnation. It's a great line. Repentance, all that means is God helped to change my mind so I can change my actions. And again, that's an invitation. It's up to us. Am I going to allow God to change my mind so my actions are changed? Am I going to do that or am I just going to feel condemnation? God, I feel so bad. I feel so bad that I've done this. That's not what God was saying. He said, I will fight against them, but I want you free in any way. And if you repent, if you allow me to change your thinking, you're not going to go back to your ex-life. No, you're going to find your marriage getting strengthened with me. You're going to see that difference. And that's what God wants us to do. I mean, I love that Jesus shows even more love here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. You might say, Pastor JJ, you just lost me. That's okay. As duet comes up, let me explain what God's talking about here. This is a beautiful thing here. So he's saying, if you confess, if you're renewing that commitment, God, change my mind so I can fully stay in this relationship with you. If you can fully do this, that's a part of us examining our heart. It's part of us examining our heart. That's why we're doing communion today. And if you haven't picked up communion, feel free. You can get up right now and get some from the back. It's okay. I know some of you forgot it. It's okay. You don't have to feel bad. <laughs> you know, but go ahead and grab some from the back if you forgot it. And the Bible talks about this in 1 Corinthians 11. It says that we're supposed to examine our hearts before we take communion. And why does he say that we're supposed to examine our hearts? Because we need to see, well, have I allowed my soul to cover what my spirit's doing? Have I let my mind, my will, and my emotions guide me away from eternally where God's wanting me to go in this great walk with him to do things in and through me? Am I allowing him to do that, or am I focusing on my own way? What am I actually doing? And when we're examining our hearts, it's not for us to feel condemnation. Again, conviction is good. Conviction shows God loves you, and he cares about where you're going. He cares what direction you're going. If you're feeling conviction, does not mean you're not saved anymore. It doesn't mean that you've dropped God off or anything else like that. Saying, God, I want to have a stronger relationship with you. I'm wanting to renew my vows. And guess what? You can renew your vows every day with God. You can constantly, he's like, look, I, I constantly have new mercies for you every day. I constantly want to have that relationship. I want to be built every day. And even if you feel that you cheat on me today, I'm still going to love you tomorrow. That's the kind of love we can't find anywhere else. Ain't nobody else going to deal with that, right? <laughs> 
But that's the love that God has. That's why it's greater than anything that we've ever even imagined because God has that great care that he has. It's important for us to understand victory is still available. It says to those who are victorious. He doesn't say, hey, you screwed up. You've been sleeping around. You've been doing all these things with the occult. You've been doing all this horrible stuff that the people have been okay with. You've been doing all these things, and now I'm done with you. No, he says, no, you can still be victorious. So no matter where you're at today, you can still be victorious in Jesus. He still has care for you. He still wants to help you out in these next steps. We have a chance. So you might say, well, what's that hidden manna stuff, Pastor JJ? That's some weird stuff. What's he talking about there? Well, in Jewish belief is that there was some manna that was hidden away until Christ would return. He's saying, hey, I want to let my Jewish listeners know, guess what? I'm going to return and you could be there with me. I'm going to have a communion meal with you. If you repent, everything is forgiven. I'm bringing here together. I'm not going to put this in front of you all the time and say, I can't believe that you cheated on me. He's going to say, I'm so glad that we're married together. He's saying that to his Jewish listeners. The stone that is given, he's saying now to his Gentile listeners. So stones were given to people who were victorious in different battles. They were given this stone, and they were able to use the stone as an invitation to get into different meals. So that was kind of how the bouncer checked you at the door. Did you have a white stone or not? If you had your stone with a name engraved on it to say, hey, this is my name, this is my part that's in there, now you're able to get in. So he's telling his Jewish audience, he's saying, hey, God wants to have this meal with you. He's telling his Gentile audience, God wants to have this meal with you. And I love that he says he engraves a name that nobody else even knows. He changes their identity. Isn't that great that God knows that about us? He can say, look, you might have had this relationship that you have, but I don't look at you as adulterer. No, I look at you as son and daughter. That's how I see you. That's now your name. We might feel that we have some other names that are written on us, that we've done some things that are so bad that that is our name, that that's what we're actually calling ourselves. That's not what Jesus sees. He says, no, if you repent, if you ask to change your mind, to change your actions, I'm going to help to show you a difference in your life, a new name. You look at people like Jacob in the Bible. His name meant heel grabber or deceiver. What did God change it to? Israel, one who wrestles with God. Like, look, you, you wrestled with your faith. And you came out on top. That's awesome. And we're going to have some times we're going to need to wrestle with our faith. Amen. And that's okay. God doesn't knock us for that. He doesn't, he doesn't mock us in those things, saying, I can't believe you're doing that. He's saying, no, no, that's a great thing. Let me help you to show, find, find the victory that's available to you. You see that with Peter. He was called Simon at first, but then he calls him Peter. The rock, everything's now going to be built on your confession of faith. The whole church is going to be based on that confession. I'm changing your name. He does that with Paul. He's this known as Saul beforehand. This person went around and was jailing Christians, having Christians killed. He says, no, you're no longer Saul. I'm now calling you Paul. Why is he changing his name? He's saying, hey, I want people to look at you differently because you need to look at yourself differently. And that was hard, because even in Paul's writings, he says, I'm the chief of all sinners. He kept on going back to that place, but then he would remember the greatness of God and say, no, but I'm changed. I know what my past was, and I'm not going to go back there anymore. I'm going to go in the freedom that God has given me. That's what God's doing, and he's got available for you at this meal. So as we stand today, and we prepare to take communion, what Jesus tells him, he says, you're in a place where Satan is on his throne in your town. We have to ask ourselves right now as we're examining our hearts, what's on the throne of our lives right now? Am I listening to the quote-unquote freedom that I'm hearing from society that I can do and everything's fine with that because that's what society says? Or am I looking to the freedom, the real part that God has for me, the strong marriage that God wants to have with us? Which one am I looking at? What's on the throne of my heart? And again, not condemnation, conviction. This is something we need to look into our own lives. That's why he says to examine our hearts every single time we take communion. This God's going to show us something different. Again, not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It shows God's love. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Before we take of communion, the Bible says that we're not to take communion in an unworthy matter. An unworthy matter is one is just we're taking it because everybody else is taking it. We're taking it because culturally that's what you do. We're taking it because that's what's expected of me. But the Bible says the worthy matter is when we're a child of God. And how do we become a child of God? The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, 
Again, that means I'm giving you that driver's seat. Are we going to fight for that will? Unfortunately, yes, we'll fight for that will. We're saying, God, I want to give you that driver's seat, and every single day, allow me to give you more and more of the driving. Allow me to, to control, to give it over to you more and more. Help me to not be that backseat driver because of what my mind, my will, and my emotions wants me to do. But allow me to trust in you. And if you believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, if you believe that Jesus did that great miracle, that you could believe that Jesus could do the miracle in you to create your spirit to be alive. If you're here and you're saying, for the first time, I want to make that decision to have Jesus as my Lord. I believe he came, he died, he rose. And I want to follow him. If that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to raise your hand so we can pray with you. Right now, we're going to take some time to just examine our hearts. Before we take communion, before we even take of that meal. Again, before they were even invited, they still were asked to repent first. Again, this isn't, oh man, I've been feeling so horrible, I've been feeling so bad, I've messed up so much. No, it's saying, God, I want to walk in your freedom again. I want to renew my vows right now. I want to see that we have that relationship and it's beautiful. Jesus did all the work. He's just asking us to trust and to follow and to remain faithful. You're saying, God, I need that today. This duet plays here. If you can do that last song you did in the set, that'd be awesome. Thank you. But we're just going to have a time of just speaking out to God. And we all have different things that we struggle with. Every single person here. That's why I said at the beginning, you had to say amen, or you had to say ouch. Just parts of this, when I was writing it, I said ouch. God wants to work in all of our hearts today. Let's let him do that. Let's just be real with him today. God, I've been flirting with this part of my ex-life. God, help me to fully commit every single day. And if I mess up, if I fall down, God, we know that you're there to pick me up. But I don't want to use that as an excuse to continue to sin, knowing that you're going to pick me up. No, I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful. God, help me to continue to love you more and more. Find that commitment more and more every single day out of love, not because I feel I have to, but because I want to. Thank you so much for this time. Let's just use this time as prayer right where you're at. If you want to come down to the front, that's fine. You can do that if you want. Just take your communion with you because we're going to take communion here at the very end. But just find a place. Let's just be real with God right now. That's your right place.
one voice saying, I won't go back. Let that be your declaration right now. Before we take communion, um, we had another word that was given this last week that I want to say out to the congregation. May you always seek him in all people and see him even on the cloudy and foggy days. May the net you cast out bring forth all his fish and feed you his word. God, we know right now there's nothing more that the enemy would want to do is to use a sermon of freedom. And to make us feel it was a sermon of our failures. God, we know that you've brought forth this message, God, allowing us to see that invitation of repentance to change our thinking. God, we, we call this series of love letters because you care so much about us. You care so much about us to not just allow us to continue to live in that lifestyle anymore, to go back to that ex-life that's only going to hurt us. It's only going to scar us continuously again and again. While we feel we're leaving, living in freedom, God, well, we're really living in slavery. So we pray, God, for those days that just feel cloudy and stormy, that makes it just feel it's so easy to go back to that ex-life, to a life that we feel like we can control, that allows us to look at it with rose-colored glasses, that it's not a big deal when those stresses come. May we turn to you when those stresses come. May we realize, God, that you care so much about us. God, as this word said that you want us to cast out that net, you're wanting other people to get to know about who you are and the greatness of who you are. God, we can't share that greatness if we're not living that greatness. If we're living in slavery, we can't talk about freedom. So, God, I pray that they will see the freedom that you've given them. God, as you ended this letter to all those who are victorious, given that invitation to that meal with you. So God, as we prepare for communion by examining our hearts, God, may we see that we are coming to this victorious. We're not coming with our past. That past was nailed on the cross. That's what we're celebrating with communion. We're not coming to this with our old name, with our old shame. No, we're coming with that new name that you give us. Daughter, son of the risen king. God, allow us to see the freedom that is given in you as we take this with confidence of what you did on the cross. We thank you so much in Jesus Christ's name. Let's prepare as we take the bread. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So remember the victory we have in him. Let's take this together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the victory. The victory we have because you paid the cost on the cross. The victory we have to not have to go back to that ex-life anymore, but to live in freedom, to grow in relationship with you, to have a stronger and stronger bond with you every single day, that is available to us because of what you did on the cross. We thank you for that love that was shown in Jesus Christ's name. Let's prepare to take the juice. Jesus also said, this cup is a new covenant that's done in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. See, the, the old covenant was you better be doing every single part of the law, otherwise you're not good enough. Jesus said, my blood makes you good enough. You can come right to me. And he asked us to trust him to follow him. Not to feel that we have to, but because we want to, because we know his better is better for us. So let's take this knowing the freedom we have in it.
Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the freedom that's found in your blood. But as we read there in Romans 6, it's not a freedom to continue to go on sinning, but it's freedom to follow. Without any kind of weights or chains holding us down from our slavery, we're now able to run with you, God, forward to that future you have for us. God, we are so grateful. We're grateful for the love, the freedom, God, the trust we can have in you that you showed on the cross. We thank you for all that you're doing in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. I want to encourage you outside. We got some tables set up. If you want to help us set up some other tables and chairs, feel free. Please stay for the meal. If you're right, say, hey, I didn't bring anything. That's okay. You can help out with some tables and chairs. That's cool. If you really, really feeling bad about it, you go to Jewel or something like that, you know, feel free. But let's uh, all eat together and let's have a great time and fellowship together. Get to know one another, all right? God bless you. See you afterwards. See you on Wednesday at 7.